how did I end up here? There's one answer to that. Emily Blunt, powerful Blunt, been cranking out some really good stuff over the years. She elevates films by her presence alone. That tone of voice, energy, and genialness make her a perfect fit. Yeah, there's some duds here and there, but please, when you love something, are you going to let the garbage that surrounds it stop you? When it comes to my favorite actresses, she's firmly in my top 10. Somewhere under Marion Cotillard and above Catherine Winnick. To get that place in my ranking means I'm not fucking around. She's competing with actresses I adore. In wanting to see more of her on screen, I found my summer of love nestled away at the early points of her acting career. That area you aren't even thinking seriously of unless you're a fan. The place where you think a director you've never heard of doing some small indie flick won't amount to anything. And the Oscar goes to... Ida. <laughs> 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 Oh god, how did I get here? Oh yeah, no kidding. Well, anyway, I watched it. With its basic premise of summer relationships and preconceived thoughts of teen angst and mid-2000s pop culture in my head, turns out I was way off the mark, and now I'm here talking about an art house film that had a bigger impact on me than most major movies I've watched in the past few years. For a movie about teenage girls, it's a very adult-oriented viewing. This comes down to the story's foundation, the director's adaptation, and the skillful performances of its main cast. I dug deep to make sure I wasn't screwing this backstory up. In 2001, Helen Cross released her novel My Summer of Love. I was 11 at the time, so of course I never knew about it. It was a story about a 15-year-old Yorkshire girl, Mona, stuck in a life going nowhere in 1984 England. She lives with her sister and brother at a pub, aimlessly going about her life. She befriends an upper-class teen, Tamsin, which is when things start to bloom. It's a book that makes implications about classism, 80s British society, family, vicariousness, and the lucidity of youth and summer. Around the same time, director Pavel Pavlikovsky had finished his movie Last Resort. His hands-on, documentary-heavy background gave him experience with realism, which he was now able to flex on bigger projects. After reading Summer of Love in 2002, Pavel was impressed and wanted it to be his next film. The initial legwork felt to him in close confidants to push location scouting, casting calls, and financing through their own time and money. This took a good year alone, as they inched their way toward what they could call a cast and crew with a production studio behind them. His leads would be Patty Considine, who he worked with in Last Resort and had become more well known as a result as well as two young, relatively unknown ladies. The first was 22-year-old Natalie Press, who had just been in the future Oscar-winning short Wasp. Good short, but while watching it, I instinctively had to look up if the British had their own word for white trash. Lastly, after months of searching and testing in order to find the perfect match to Press's character and Pavel's loose direction, one talent earned the role. 20-year-old Emily Blunt. Pavel knew he found someone special when she nailed the screening unlike any of the previous tryout contenders. Back in the summer of 2003, Europe was going through a grueling heatwave, like it is right now. 2019 broke the 2003 record. Right now I'm recording this in July and early August of 2019, so yeah. At the time, Britain saw some of the highest temperatures in decades. It was under these conditions that filming took place with Pavel moving exterior shots to the front of principal photography. Figures that such intense heat should reflect the two leads' affection for each other. As for the script, it was a bare-bones 37 pages, if that. Yeah, an 84-minute movie on a script of only some 35 concrete pages, with the rest being notes. Pavel, in adapting Cross's novel, chose to take extensive liberties, removing entire subplots, characters, themes, and more. In his own words, he stripped everything away. He wasn't interested in the realistic sociological portrayal of Britain. He was fascinated by the two girls, the way they perceived each other, wanting to let that relationship take course in ambiguous fashion. This may have some credence in how Pawlikowski's childhood as a Polish immigrant relied on observation, indistinctness in communication, and a more timeless form of England rather than strictly 80s. This lent itself to the script, which Pawlikowski wanted, aside from key scenes, to have a natural and improvisational feel to it. Blunt explains this in an early interview. The greatest insight for, excuse me, bullshit than I've ever seen, you know, it's 
amazing. He he knows when you're acting and he knows when you're not. And he's um, he's wonderful on moments. He'll create moments rather than trying to maybe make the whole scene clear. He'll find just moments in it that are just beautiful, and he'll tap into that with just such insight, really, into what works and what doesn't. And um, and I've never felt so real in anything before. I mean, I guess all the other stuff I've done, it's been, you know, a very s strict script and you stick to it and you learn your lines a week before you go in and you know exactly what you're doing um, before you go in. And with Pavel, you know, I'm driving into work and I don't know which scenes I'm doing really. I don't know what I'm going to be saying. And so in that way, it's so much in the moment all the time. What a pro. So, to sum this all up so far, the movie has about as much in common with the book as the names of the two lead characters, the rural English setting, falling in love, a Christianity angle, and hanging out. Conversely, almost everything else is Pavel's creation. Considine's character was reinvented, extra family members were taken out, religion was heavily emphasized, and the focus was strictly on these three characters. On the surface, that may seem like a big detraction, having lost the core of Cross's vision. After seeing this, a closer adaptation would be interesting, but I'm consigned to the film's version. Pavel transforms Cross's story into one with finely crafted, heated romantic realism. Let's just go right to the beginning, so I don't have to be all over the place anymore. The first 10 minutes of this waste no time in getting the setup out of the way. Mona, strewn on the side of the road, meets Tamsin. Her first appearance is some regal shit on top of a horse. I'm already spellbound. Right off the bat, showcasing her confidence and dominance over a steed. The two immediately hit it off as if they're the only two girls their age in town. Throughout this entire movie, in fact, these two never interact with any others in their age group. Granted, it's slim pickings in small villages. You're supposed to just get that this is as country as England gets amidst its Yorkshire landscape. But I can go one level deeper. The movie's setting, while it could represent any village in the area, was filmed primarily in Todmorn and Cornholm. Mona's exterior shots take place in Cornholm, while Tamsin's is in Todmorn. Pavel made some perfect choices in his scouting, intermixing industrial with natural, poor with rich, new with old, and his own shooting styles. After her first meeting with Tamsin, Mona returns to the pub she lives at with her ex-con brother, Phil. Phil's gone born again while in prison, bringing his beliefs into Mona's life by turning the pub into a place of worship. All it does is make her want to escape to Tamsin that much more, wishing at the same time for Phil to return to the way he was. Phil's evangelical scenes have the look and feel of a documentary. Shaky cam, raw, detached, and unfiltered. A style reminiscent of Pavel's prior experience filming Christian groups. Compare this with the way Tamsin's scenes are. Sizzling, erotic, inviting, and idyllic. The color grading alone makes the film look like it's filtered through a sunny olden lens. Practically all films go through this color correction and grading process that turn an otherwise flat, desaturated look into something visually appropriate. Here, appropriate means warm, luminous, and bloomy, giving off that fairy tale like atmosphere. Anyway, Mona's next meetup is at her new friend's family estate in the hills above Todmorn. Which, if we're talking actual locations, is a couple miles away, but I'll leave that alone. It's almost dreamlike the way she drifts into Tamsin's decorative lifestyle of entertainment, escapism, and elitism. And yes, that's really her playing the ch- Oh, that steel gaze, man. She paid attention in her classes while I put in minimal effort in my four years of viola playing. Mona's literally lured in by her seductive swan song, the whole thing set up like a personal demonstration. Me being charmed is a no-brainer. For Tamsin, this is easy. At the beginning, she herself stated that she's a bad influence on people, yet this doesn't put off Mona. They're enabling each other at this point. Blunt had this to say about their relationship. A romantic figure, and she loves this image of herself, like, totally in control, and wants Mona to be in, in awe of her. And the scene actually had just allowed me to do that. It's really... Um, it's just full of life and soul, and it's fantastic, so I think, and that was the one that worked. The two teens, lacking direction and older figures to steer them in the proper direction, grow attached to each other. One thing to note about their activities together, as well as the movie as a whole, is the distinct lack of any major electronics. 
television, computers, phones, also lacking are pop culture references and any outside music from that era. Summer of Love mercifully excludes these as to not have any depreciation of the film's age, which both makes it look older but feel more enduring than it really is. There's a big difference between old-fashioned and outdated. Look back on early 2000s movies and you'll know exactly which ones didn't stand the test of time. Here we see both teens doing what they think they should be doing and naively falling in love. Judging these characters, I wouldn't outright call this a lesbian romance at its core. More like a result of their hurt lives and multifarious interest in one another. There is a physical attraction, but their friendship isn't founded or maintained on a basis of equality. Blunt gave her take on this as well. Mona, and Mona becomes her everything, you know, and um, she sees this, there's a certain danger and an edge about Mona that Tamsin doesn't have, and um, Mona's bravery sort of manages to sort of seep into her after a while, and she likes that, and she likes what Mona brings out in her. And um, she's, she's like a little pet to Tamsin. She's so sweet and sort of, you know, Tamsin can manipulate her and she knows that Mona's besotted with her and kind of plays on that. But I think um, for Mona, it's more that she throws herself in, into the relationship with all her heart, but with Tamsin, she throws herself into it with all of her head. And she's the best method actress you could have, you know, in every situation, in every kind of intimate, you know, lovely situation that they have. It's more of a sort of, act with her. It's more of a, um, that she pretends it's sort of a scene out of something. That's how I see her, that she's not always completely truthful with Mona. And that's where I have to leave it for you to explore. The lack of any major action or plot leaves only the study of the characters and their lives during this heated summer. Mona's life being in the middle of this Christian revival and her flight of the imagination for Tamsin. As Blunt explained, based on romantic ideals instead of realistic outlook, it's a story that questions people's intentions, genuineness, their values, and their identities. And at its center are two teens, in that one summer together, falling in love for reasons that, as vulnerable and as fanciful as it is, feel right in the moment. Pavel's adaptation is one done right. It takes free reign over the source, turning it into something linked in spirit. It's dubbed as a lesbian film, which can be true, but is kind of misleading. The film doesn't make a big deal on homosexual aspects of their romance, as much as lingering tensions with the Christian angle would have one expect. There's so much else to dig through in an otherwise small-scale story. I can only recommend seeing it yourself. It took a long time before I did, making me wish I had known about it all those years ago. People's lives converging on projects like this make for choice reads, especially knowing what became of them. Back then, promo for the film relied on Pavel's growing reputation and the power of its two leads. Ultimately, Summer of Love was a critical hit that helped all of its main stars. Pavel, of course, still makes films today, nabbing an Oscar midway. Considine would be in numerous films and TV shows, eventually winning a BAFTA for one of his directorial works. Press continued British productions until recently where it seems she sought work away from acting. And lastly, Blunt herself became a huge name in the business. Seeing her here so young yet so attention-grabbing, it makes sense that she'd be killing the game years later. And it first took that one hot summer to prove just how awesome she was.